recording. Okay, we're recording. Excellent. Um, and we, we have uh, yeah, that's fine. recording going, I think. You press the on button, all that, all right. Uh, kind of stoked that it got recorded because uh, I talked to a couple of people that weren't here that got to watch it already, and that's me. That. That's totally cool. Um, well, let's get rolling. Let's find out. Did everybody get one of these? Blue, blue, blue. We're good. Great. And then, oh, you can't, yeah. And then we have our notes from last week as well. And, and I'm excited you guys have the notebooks too. I, you know, seeing you guys in church, and I saw the notebooks. I just felt like the students are back. They're, they have their papers. I like that. And I want to get that kind of spirit going so that uh, we build on what we're learning. Um, in a couple of moments, we are going to do a little bit of review. And so, who is here this week that wasn't here last week? Right on. Wow. Good. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So, when we get into a little bit of discussion, pay particular attention to the discussion just so we kind of get all caught up with one another. Um, also, as Father was talking in church about the chains um, of St. Peter's, St. Peter's chains, yeah, it, it struck me that just the imagery of chains is actually something I want us just to appreciate. And in our topic of getting love right, we know that when we don't get love right, um, there's sort of a, we can feel the chains of that. We can feel the bondage of that. Uh, when we start to get love right, then we get a sense that the chains are like broken or they're, we feel a little freer. So definitely, um, I want to just acknowledge that if we're sitting here tonight and we have a sense of chains in our life, that I want to acknowledge that, that I'm glad you're here, or if you have a loved one that's kind of chained up, I want to acknowledge that, that, you know, that that's on your heart and that somehow our hearts coming together really is, as Father said in church, has something to do with healing, has something to do with breaking the chains, has something to do with when we're not getting it right, we'll feel it, we'll feel the effect of it. Well, as we look at um, this topic and way of review a little bit, um, what I'd like you guys to do, and I want you guys to be a little chatty tonight, so I'm going to break you up into groups for like four minutes, but I don't want you to be, we'll break up into groups for four minutes. We'll stare at each other for three minutes. Uh, and then at the end we say, what's your name? You know, um, and then I say, okay, let's have a discussion after that. And then you guys will stare at me. Okay, so we're not going for that model, all right? So I want kind of a, I want you to jump in to discussion. And what I'd like us to do is kind of what hit you? What hit you last week? And if you have your notes from last week, kaboom, what, what spoke to you? What stood out if you picked one thing from last week that you want to recall, and then in your little group, if someone wasn't there that's in your group that's here this week, then I want you to share it, but kind of say, this is what it was, or this is why it was important to me, okay? And definitely, you know, you're sharing something personal of what it is you're going to share and why that was important to you, all right? So, about four minutes, remember what I told you about the the way I don't want you to do it, right? So we want to just jump in, find something meaningful. Really, you know, our series is life from the heart. So we're also not saying, I'm going to share something, use a bunch of words, uh, because somehow it stimulated my brain. Just something that touched your heart. And why, okay? Four minutes, ready, set, go find your people. About three people around you. Ready, set, go.
minutes. Get anybody else. Oh, one more minute. That's your plan.
very often, if you've been on the planet for a while, that question kind of got kicked around and didn't get answered perfectly. And so then the net net is our sense of worthiness when, when, when it's really quiet at 3 in the morning, we find out what we're really thinking. Our sense of war when we make a mistake or when we get disapproval from, from someone, that's when it's going to start revealing that, ooh, this value, this worthiness, which I don't think I can possess it in me. So when we don't believe we have worthiness or value within ourselves, then that leads to what we'll talk a bit more about in review tonight, this, this <coughs> belief that I'm going to find value where? Out there somewhere, right? Okay? Yes? Don't carry baggage. Okay, don't carry baggage. Let go of it. Yeah, good, good, good. And, and, and what I saw about this is if you let go of the baggage then, and let, let life unfold naturally, you'll have a wonderful time. Okay. And, and, and what I thought this would be good is when I, when I saw your talk, by the way, for those of you, his talk is on the internet. Uh, and, and I'm Don't believe everything you hear on the internet, especially. <laughs> <laughs> but what I was thinking is this would be great for kids, especially like if they're on a team in a team like like a, a little league or whatever. Don't live in the past. Think about the fun that you're having yep. tonight with your friends, and just have fun. So we're reminded, we talked about sports psychology, which is kind of the premise of the present moment, which in sports psychology, they call the zone. Uh, good, so if we get reminded that, gosh, if we even think about family life, the thought that our kids could get trained in some healthy thinking, might, we might do them a favor that way. What else came up that you wanna? Good, good, good. The good things, even the bad things, yeah. even everything. Good. Like good, good, good. So then we'd say, there was a, there was a, so we have love. I had this client uh, who said to me one time, and, and I, I learned so much from my clients, and she used this phrase, and she said, I had to check my come from. And I said, excuse me, I had to check my come from. What's that? Just, well, I had to check where it was coming from. And what she reflected on is, sometimes she could do the right thing but not come from love, and it doesn't turn out well. Something backfires. So it reminds me that if it's coming from love, we've just brought something healthy. Can't control all things, but if we're coming from love, something healthy is present. Good. Yes? What uh, really spoke to me was uh, getting stuck in your head okay. and not really going from your heart. Okay. And that can kind of, that, at least for me, sometimes I, I, I overthink things so much it freezes me. Yes. And I, can't, so, I can't move forward. So, and, and in fact, with that, we're going to segue just to our next point where I want you guys to do a little bit of discussion. But we'd say very much central to our discussion last week. And we'd also say something also central if we understand, if we want to understand like in simple terms what can explain a lot of our mental difficulties can be described as when we get stuck in our head which very often means we are functioning in a way that overthinks, remember that? We obsess, which means we overfocus, and whenever we overfocus, whatever problem is there, just multiply by many, you know, big numbers. Uh, a lot of symptoms come from being in our head. So with that, let me just ask, because I told you that I'd ask you that this, we didn't have time last week. So when we think about living in the head, Another way to say it, I kind of, kind of like this way of saying it, living life without the inner life. And I'd say that, in a way, we can say the way of the world, if, we, if we're not just checking ourselves, the way of the world will, will, will steer us toward living life without the inner life. And so, if we think about, or we can use the sports psychology metaphors to say, if we're not in the heart, if we're not in the zone, if we're not in the present moment, if we are we in to go away our head too much, as I know at the bottom, being in our head messes with our game. Every professional athlete knows that. So what happens? What's it look like if we're in our parenting life, if we're in our head too much, if we're doing parenting life without the inner life? 
What's our kids' life like if they try to do life without the inner life? What's our personal life like if we try to do our personal life without the inner life? What's marriage or relationship life like, like without the inner life? What's church like? What's ministry like without the inner life? Okay? So I might give you four and a half minutes on this one. Okay? I want you to just try to, I mean, there's a, I mean that could take days to talk about this. I want you to go with just your instinct on what if we're trying to do parenting without our heart? If we're doing parenting from our head, if we're doing relationship from our head, if we're doing church from our head and not our heart, what kinds of things come to mind? Okay? So find your people again. Four minutes. Ready, set, go. What comes to mind? Pause. One more minute. Leapfrogging over, 
uh, are not coming from that place, then just what we're saying right there gives us a lot of, you know, sort of insight on, wow, do I know when I come from a place of fear? Do I know when I'm coming across control? Like, remember Jill Hari's window last week? Like, I'm aware, they're aware. Or the hidden, I'm aware, they're not aware. That's a hidden part of our life. Or the blind spot, this is great at parenting. I'm not aware, they're aware. That's us and our kids. They, they get our number, like, whoa, they're freaking on that one. Mom's tripping on that one, you know? And we think, like, oh, good, I'm glad I handled it that way. You know, so, all, so there's a lot, there's a lot that happens when we're in our head, okay? All right, our kids. Now, your kids are all Two, five, eight. Two, five, eight. Okay. Now, who has kids older than that? What ages are we representing here? 20s. 20s? 30s. 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 35. Right on, little babies, yep. <laughs> Six, oh, right on. I like that, Dougie. Um, teenagers, okay, right? So when we think about our kids of all those ages, what have we begun to observe and or reflect on when our kids are in their head and skip over their inner life? What goes on in their life? Chaos. Chaos? Okay. Yeah, so we'd say definitely... Things like common to our current youth culture. This is numero uno right here. And the other numero uno, interesting because we're talking about life without the inner life, that actually describes the youth culture today, is they're dying for inner life, but somehow they got like a navigation and it has rerouted them to get all the enjoyment of the inner life without the inner life. So that's why self-medicating is going up, but that's why like suicidal, first breakup, I think I'm suicidal, because there's like this big grand canyon of emptiness. They, they just want to feel good and don't know how to get there, okay? But they're convinced they want to feel good. So we kind of have a, a pleasure culture without the path to really feeling good. Mm -hmm. So we have definitely an anxious uh, set of kids, uh, and we'd say, you know, a lot of confusion going on. And so maybe I'll feel better if I try this and try that. Every, I mean, everything from what they do with their bodies to what they do with the gender to what they do with uh, various combinations of uh, pills and smoking and drinking. So, so our kids' life without the inner life is playing itself out. We, I want us to keep this in mind because if we're like trying to you know, live a good solid life, church going and all that, if by accident we'll get to ministry and church life in a second, but if we do church life without the inner life, that could be one of the worst things we could do because our kids are looking to have the inner life and if they see, wow, look at all that real special stuff, but they do it in... They talk smack about everybody when they drive home from church or whatever. Like if they're just seeing this other side that's not from the heart, mm. they will say, oh, glad I got exposed to it. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go that way. So we, we want to keep in mind what we're modeling from the heart or not. Uh, what would come to mind, again, we want to be uh, cautious on time here, but what comes to mind? Somebody's just trying to have a personal life. Here we are. We're just trying to have a personal life. What comes to mind when a person just tries to have their own personal life bypassing really going through the heart, really going through their inner life. Okay, yeah, very good. So we say that ultimately we become the ultimate consumer. Without the inner life, why wouldn't we be selfish? Because when we have the inner life and we're in the heart, there's something about joy and something about, wow, how are you doing, that really makes relationships powerful and, and, and meaningful, but if we're not having that meaning of connection with the other, then it's really going to be like what my taste buds are going to tell me to eat. It's kind of like instant gratification. Yes. You, you don't have that, you know, the build up for anything. Yep. Really. It's just, it has to happen now before it's going to happen. So we could say life without the heart could be, if we look at it from a developmental psychology perspective, perspective, it would dwarf our develop our emotional development. Like we'd stay babies, sort of. If, if we don't have the inner life, 
We can't grow. We can't grow up. We might as well be a grown baby. And I think, you know, culture today is kind of like, sort of like, oh, let's be grown babies. The women can get their nails done. The guys can play golf. But let's just be grown babies. Like, there's kind of, there's an art form. Maybe even reality TV is sort of grown baby TV. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, it's entertaining. Can I get it? Wait, that Housewives? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I don't know which ones you watch, but Housewives of Orange County. <laughs> and I'm not criticizing them, but but they're grown babies with big boobs. Like, I mean, it's just like, <laughs> they're grown babies. Have you, I, mean, I shouldn't say that, sure, sorry, Father. <laughs> okay. Um, it's true. I think you have a whole you get that no. no, but if you think about reality TV, there's very little in your life, mm-hmm. and there's a lot of squawking. Right? Yeah. schools we get a whole lot of crazy drama and so I can't watch those shows yeah. because it's like hanging around the 7th and 8th graders yeah that's really I just can't a do great that. one that's terrifying bill. yeah no that's awesome I love that that Stuff instinct you have <laughs> that should never happen to anyone no right so so what we want to do too with how we're kind of joking but I think true you know about you know uh, reality TV whatever is um and that show just came on in case you're tuning in. Um, um, is we almost want to identify with it to say, in what way do I create drama? In what way, when I'm not in my heart, do I almost show up certain ways? Maybe it's like really exaggerated on TV, but we just want to get a feel for that. What, what does that mean? Okay. So, okay, moving along. Uh, church life. Uh, or a married life. What, what's fundamentally what ultimately happens in our married life when we skip over the heart? We become very controlling. Okay, controlling okay. for sure. Okay. Critical, judgmental. So we definitely want to jot that down, like in this in this world of life in the head. And and, and as, as I mentioned last week, um, that when you're with your partner long enough. You notice that their defects don't go away. So then if you're in your head, you make like an art form out of noticing not only their defects not going away, but how they seem to be accumulating more. Right? So, and it, I mean, and that really leads to real life problems. I mean, we literally, because we keep skipping over the heart, we literally can't tolerate that. And so then we do survival things, like leave, you know, be parallel but never intersect, or whatever that is, but we know we're in survival mode. So let's keep that in mind because that creeps up on us. And we want to keep in mind, wow, I'm seeing the defect more than the person. My journey to the heart, which is the whole point of this series, getting love right, the whole point of this class, is how do I get back? To my heart. Now, just we're going to springboard into new stuff for about two minutes. But church life, ministry life, what does that turn into without the heart? A chore. A chore, yeah. Yeah, volunteering is like, why am I doing this for free? You know, whatever. Like, we start, it doesn't feel worth it. Okay? What else happens with ministry life, church life without the heart? What's that? No, I said to the man. Bless you. Bless you. Married. I oh, bless, bless you. you, yeah. Oh. We sneeze when we're out. You get complacent. <laughs> okay, we start, our metrics start changing. Yeah. So if we don't come from the heart, we're not going to measure success from the heart, which means we measure success from the head, and that can be any assortment of ways, which starts being you know, numbers or, or like I'm somebody because I check the records on stewardship and I get more than anybody, or whatever. Mm-hmm. We start getting a sense of, of how it should be. Okay. What, what, what kind of characteristics happen in church life when the heart starts going away? Without joy. Okay, without joy, for in, sure. Indifference. Indifference. Competitive. Competitive. Yeah. Cynicism. Cynicism. I mean, look at all these kinds of emotions, right? And that's in the church, right? So we go, wow, the devil can yeah. do a lot of damage and just neutralize any power we have because the 
the power we have is love, if we get out of our heart, we lose that part. And a lot of what you guys said about judgment and control is like church central. A lot of dysfunction that happens in churches is judgment and control. And sure, and who's doing what, and whatever, who gets credit and all this. So we can see that, and this is why we, we reflected on this last week, that to see ourselves as we really are, as a miracle of and raise the dead, we see that our purpose in chatting and reviewing and then launching into what we're going to launch into is any kind of healthy psychology and any kind of healthy theology intersects at that beautiful miracle of self-reflection. So everything we just discussed is meant to be part of your assignment of your own self-reflection. That if one of those areas of life spoke to you, like, oh, Lord, help me be in my heart with, my, with that one kid that took after my spouse, or however that works, however you get triggered, right? Help me with that area of life uh, because I'm having a hard time being in my heart in that area. So that's our self-reflection, and then it turns into our spiritual life. Okay. That all set. Then we, and then I'll just land the plane with this. And I took my drawing from last week and just said, when that value isn't all resolved, and when we get into our third month, on, you know, next month, February, we're going to talk about family dynamics. We're going to unpack this like crazy. But when we don't sense, when we're not okay on the inside, we look for our worthiness outside, right? So, again, whether you want to do your little drawing, but, but the... But the reflection is this, and I've read this to some of you before. But it can be said this way, if I could find it. And I shared this with the family, uh, the family night that I came to one time. But uh, this little book from many centuries ago, the early church fathers on passions, the Holy Fathers teach. The teaching of the Orthodox Church Fathers may be summarized by this parable in the city, there was a courtesan. Remember what that meant? It's like a prostitute, like a popular one in town. In the city, there was a courtesan who had many lovers. The governor came to her and said, if you promise to be good, I'll marry you. She promised, and the governor brought her to his house, to his home. But her former lovers said to each other, that ruler took her to his house let us go to the back of the house and whistle for her. And then when she recognizes the whistle, she'll come down. When she heard the whistle, she stopped her ears and withdrew to an inner chamber, shutting the door fast behind her. Abba John explains that the courtesan represents our soul. Her lovers are the passions. The governor is Christ. And the inner chamber is the eternal dwelling. Those who whistle are the demons. Behold how the soul took refuge in the Lord. So we have a very profound, powerful teaching of what we know to be the passions in psychological terms and in way of our little drawings. We say when we don't feel value in here, we go seek value out there. We'd say like what the fathers call passions, modern psychology calls compulsions. Why is it compulsion? Because my logic doesn't tell me to go do that. Usually, my worthiness is injured in some way. My inner life is blocked because of my injury. It clogs me up. It messes with me. It's telling me that something's wrong with me, so I'm not going to find an answer within myself. So I'm going to go outside myself. That injury, in whatever way that is represented among us, Sometimes it's some kind of unmet need. Wherever we have an unmet need from that, some of that deep stuff we needed along the way, that turns into appetite. The more there's an unmet need, the stronger our appetite. The appetite is what we call addiction. The appetite is what we call compulsion. The appetite is what we call passions. The ministry of the church is to help us with those appetites gone, going crazy. I, I remember when I was about 20-something, when I realized that Kimi Leson meant something. And thank God I found out what it meant. Because you know, when something's settled, like, 
I mean, like, it, I like the rhythm of it, but I, I didn't, when I found out what it meant, this is why it mattered to me. Because the demons whistle when no one's around. And I know which arrow I'm vulnerable to follow when no one's looking. And thank God, Kirileson means Lord have mercy. So life from the heart, even in the bare essential of life from the heart would be, I'm facing what's really showing up in me, and I'm asking for mercy because it's showing up in me. That's life in the heart. When you have life in the heart that way, then when I see someone else struggle, instead of judging them, I'm having some sense of, wow, what's whistling at their back door? I want to come from the heart because I know something's going on in their heart. Okay? So there we have a, a sense of what goes on for us and how it can shift us. When we face it, this is my little formula on my worldview. When we face our true self, we find the true God. When we entertain this kind of phony self, there's a lot of phony gods we could find, and phony theologies, and phony churches. When we face the true self, we find the true God. And that's life from the heart, and that's when we begin to get love right. Okay, so, St. John Chrysostom says something super cool. When you find the gate to the heart, that's when you find the gate to the kingdom. When you take that disciplined, <laughs> courageous journey out of your head, that easy life in your head where there's lots of space, uh, the gospel, Jesus calls it the broad road. Many find it. And when you go to the narrow path, which is to your heart, there, the scripture, or uh, the fathers talk about um, I forget exactly how it's said, but it's something Angie and I were talking, Chris and I were talking about last week. Um, that what the Father's right is there's one place that God can't be. We think of God, you know, everywhere. You know, right? God, there's one place that God can't. If I got this right, there's one place that God can't be in our fantasy. God can't be in our self-delusion. God can't be in our phony self. Guess where he shows up? In our real self. Guess where the party's going to be? At the doorway of our heart when we finally say, I'm going to look at the real self and face my real feelings and find out what's really going on inside of me. Then we find the gate to the heart and then we find the gate to the kingdom. God is in reality. Psychologically, spiritually, however we get there, when we start facing reality, it's amazing how we find the kingdom. All right. Now, let me just mention this idea of getting love right. I, I want to mention two scriptures just to get our get a center that um, when Jesus said, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, that's in John 13. That you love one another. The big deal is the second part of that verse. Love as I loved you. Love one another as I loved you. So I just want to mention that if we're going to get love right, we want to be interested in knowing how did God love? How did God do it? How does God do that? Or how, in what way am I in touch with how much God loves me? What is that connection like? And then also, just for anybody who wants to do a church without the heart, the Apostle Paul just reigns on your parade. He says you get faith to the mountain. You could have prophecies, you could speak in tongues as angels, but if you have not love, zilch. If you have not love, it's like, eh. survey said, eh. So this love is a certain way of loving. So the first marital conflict happened somewhere around Genesis chapter 3. And we, we talked about it, about the love that was planted in paradise, and then the fall of man happened, and then we've been doing love outside of paradise, and that's why we are here, and 
why we go to therapy, and why we go to church, and why we say be based on because we're trying to get love right, but we're living outside of paradise. I love, so we're going to talk about blame. I'm not sure who did this like famous painting. Oh, just ponder it for a second. I love it. So this is when God shows up after everything went south. And he's all like, Adam, where are you? Like, what? what's up, guys? What happened? What? Ha you know, the serpent did his thing. They ate it for the tree. They did all that, right? It all, it all went down. The cosmos was probably like getting unhinged. And God's like, Adam, where are you guys? What happened? And what's Adam do? <laughs> I mean, I'm like, it's my language. Oh my God. This woman you gave me. <laughs> Even his like legs are like, ah. Like, ah. Okay, so the first marital therapy session, you know, didn't go so well because the main operating system was blame. We, we, we can see that love was starting to dysfunction because, why, well, we can get theological, we won't tonight, but because they went from their source of life and love and they went to this other source, this other tree. Um, but we've got to appreciate this, this blame instinct. So I want us to see, I'm going to see if this works and hopefully the sound is okay. I want us to think about blame. Now, when you fought, I will, I'll show you a little clip. I want you to jot down whatever speaks to you, whatever stands out, whatever's important to you. It's only like two minutes or something like that. Let's see if it's going to work. Watch closely. How many of you are blamers? How many of you, when something goes wrong, the first thing you want to know is whose fault it is? Hi, my name is Brene. I'm a blamer. Let me just tell you this quick story. So this is a couple years ago when I first realized the magnitude to which I blame. I'm in my house, I'm on white slacks and a pink sweater set, and I'm drinking a cup of coffee in my kitchen. It's a full cup of coffee. I drop it on the tile floor. It goes into a million pieces, splashes up all over me. And the first, I mean, a millisecond after it hit the floor, right out of my mouth is this. Damn you, Steve. <laughs> Who is my husband? Because let me tell you how fast this works for me. So Steve plays water polo with a group of friends. And the night before, he went to go play water polo. And I said, hey, make sure you come back at 10, because you know, I can never fall asleep into your home. And he got back at 10.30. And so I went to bed a little bit later than I thought. Ergo, my second cup of coffee that I probably would not be having had me come home when we discussed. Therefore... And so the rest of the story is, I'm cleaning up uh, the kitchen, Steve calls, caller ID, I'm like, hey. He's like, hey, what's going on, babe? <laughs> what's going on? Um, so I'll tell you exactly what's going on. I'm cleaning up the coffee that spilled off, like dial tone. Because he knows. How many of you go to that place when something bad happens, the first thing you want to know is whose fault is it? I'd rather it be my fault than no one's fault. Because why? Why? Because it gives us some semblance of control. But here, if you enjoy blaming, this is where you should stick your fingers in your ear and do the na-na-na-na thing because I'm getting ready to ruin it for you. Because here's what we know from the research. Blame is simply the discharging of discomfort and pain. It has an inverse relationship with accountability. Accountability, by definition, is a vulnerable process. It means me calling you and saying, hey, my feelings were really hurt about this, and talking. It's not blaming. Blaming is simply a way that we discharge anger. People who blame a lot seldom have the tenacity and grit to actually hold people accountable, because we spend all of our energy raging for 15 seconds and figuring out who's fault something us. And blame is very corrosive in relationships, and it's one of the reasons we miss our opportunities for empathy. Because when something happens and we're hearing a story, we're not really listening 
we're in the place where I was making the connections as quickly as we can about whose fault something was. Okay. What's your impression? What stands out to you on this? Did you like that little video, by the way? Yeah. yeah. Very, very cool, huh? Yeah. So we miss, so not only does blame happen, but something doesn't happen, and usually it's something to do with empathy or closeness or something. Yeah. Yeah. So notice how the control word's coming up a lot, and like you know, trying to do love outside of paradise often has control, and blame kind of at least can put it in a box. Yeah. In the back, that's all. Uh, the sentence of responsibility. Okay. So. The whole issue of responsibility comes up, and and like in therapy, definitely just that subject. I bring that up: emotional responsibility. Like, what is emotional responsibility? Blame is a classic example of holding other people responsible for what's going on inside of you, right? So, it, you know, the classic is you made me mad. From a therapy perspective, we 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 get like crazy chills when we break out hives when people say that, even though that's common. Like, you know, you made me mad. Fundamentally, it's the most emotionally irresponsible thing we could say because that's similar to you made me bomb the World Trade Center. And that's the mentality. In police reports on domestic violence, it will say very often when she, you know, I told her to not say one more thing and she did, so she made me do that. Right? Yeah. Why do we have to fix blame? You want to keep it going or what's, what's your idea? Right. And so when you're emotionally responsible, it's not complicated. Because when I'm feeling something, going through something, having some kind of reaction, I'm going to talk about me and what's going on in me. If I'm not emotionally responsible, it's like in the Little League, the, the kid strikes out and he throws the bat. That's not responsible. Somebody gets hit in the head with the bat. Okay, he may not have meant it. But there's a self-control problem, a responsibility problem, and if I'm feeling it, I get to do whatever I want. That's emotionally irresponsible. Blame is emotionally irresponsible. So when we think about like being responsible, like picking up our things and being tidy and everything goes in its place and take care of business, think about that in emotional terms. Sometimes we have our emotions all over the place. So this idea of blame is, you know, it can be a slippery slope. So I want us to think about that. Now we don't, again, with the fact that we have some weeks together, we can keep revisiting different discussions. But let's move forward to empathy. What I call the journey of love and the path uh, to emotional intelligence. So let me just broker some time here for this five minutes till I probably have 10 minutes to go. Is it okay if I go five minutes over? Is that all right, you guys? Five minutes over. I'm going to try to speed dial here. Okay. Um, Definitely, I want us to contrast blame and empathy. And remember our drawing of all the arrows and how when our well-being isn't in here, we try to find the solution out there. Mm. Interesting thing about blame, when we're not feeling okay in here, we want to find the problem out there. Like we're really seeing that we have like some radioactive problem with going in our inner life. And the blame is, I don't like to go inside of me. I'm going to not only, as, as a, let's say I'm an addict, addicted to sex, addicted to shopping, addicted to pornography, addicted to uh, materialism. Uh, that means I am have a compulsive relationship to finding my well-being with things outside of me. That's why it's an addiction or why it's a passion. Mm -hmm. If I'm a blamer, then I'm assigning all my problems to things outside of me. What does that have in common? It's not me. <laughs> and so it actually is a, a, a big blind spot of, wow, we end up Destroying relationships and never really solving problems because we're not going to the center of where things are happening within us. Okay. So I like to contrast you know, blame and empathy. 
because empathy is the other way, and empathy is, is this major characteristic of being in the heart. Now, we know, and I, when I was here a few times ago, um, I shared with you the parable of the Good Samaritan. And there's a lot we extracted from that parable. And that, in, in terms of our ministry, family wellness ministry, we use that definitely as a foundational. We don't have time tonight to totally get into it. But um, I want to mention that fundamental to the Good Samaritan, there's, there's a contrast. Again, if we have contrast between blame and empathy, or we have contrast between inner life and not inner life, we have contrast between head and heart. In that parable, we have the contrast between there's a, a, a very real need going on, and the contrast would be ew, and they went to the other side of the road, contrasted by the Samaritan who saw that and moved toward the person. Okay? So fundamentally, that parable is the parable of empathy. We could even say that if we don't have empathy, Matthew 25 talks about Jesus separating the whole world as, as sheep and goats. And you know how that whole thing goes. I was hungry, you didn't feed me. I was in prison, you didn't visit me. I was naked, you didn't clothe me. Lord, when didn't we da da da? Basically, the answer is when you didn't have empathy, is when you didn't feed me, visit me, and clothe me. So, empathy is no small part of our Christian life. In fact, it's kind of the currency of our Christian life, I think. It's kind of like what makes love make sense. The other thing we say about blame and empathy is which one, ha what, which one gets us feeling connected to people. Keep that in mind. Whatever, if we're getting love right, it has a connecting effect. If something's going a little wonky, it has a disconnecting effect. Okay? Now, I've also mentioned that something about empathy means we, we have an EQ. We're interested in understanding what someone's going through. Okay? Now, let me do this. Let's just see. Now, on this one, there's some cute little characters. I want you to pay attention to some of what's going on here. So what is empathy, and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions, where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, I'm down. I know what it's like down here. And you're not alone. Sympathy is... Ooh, it's bad, uh-huh. Uh, no, you want a sandwich? Uh, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now, I'm just so glad you told me. 
Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. Mm. Oh, that's true. Mm. All right. So, as we have a few closing now, there's some good lines in that. Uh, what'd you guys think of that? That was a good one. Yeah. yeah, right? So, uh, and we'll revisit some of those principles, but over time to develop it all. But I mean, she certainly talks about being with. And that's a real key, even in, in our generation of parents, that sometimes we're known as the helicopter parents. And we, sometimes we don't know how to be with our kids. We know how to hover over them, and that's not the same as being with. And so, or with our spouse, sometimes we're most, us guys, we love to fix. Which you know comes in handy every so often, but sometimes that doesn't give a, a, a sense of connection. We're often running fixing something, not just with the person that has the struggle. So I like the way she emphasizes with and also just anything that drives connection, anything that creates connection. So when we have more time, we'll develop more of that, but I want us to, to think about that. I, I want to say, theologically speaking, as I mentioned about empathy kind of being our sort of our language as Christians, we could say that is distinctively theological of our Christian faith. It's the only world religion where I mean, every world religion is about sort of the map of how man gets to God. Mm -hmm. And our Christian faith is very different than that. Right? But we know in theologically it's called the incarnation, and it's that, that God had the map of how to get to us, how to find us where we're at. That's empathy. That's empathy. So think about that. If, we're, if we really want to live out a Christian, just a Christian love, it's like, wow, do I have the empathy to go there when I encounter someone who is struggling? I also want to mention just in James 1.19, you know, it's so interesting, just that one verse could be a whole marriage workshop. Yeah. <laughs> Quick to listen, <laughs> slow to speak, and slow to become angry. There's a, I mean, that, that, that says a lot. I want to mention, and in closing, or I'm going to have two slides, this slide one more, in the book, um, what I call the invisible stethoscope. I haven't been a doctor. I've been, a, you know, you go to a few checkups. I don't know if you've been to a doctor lately, but you know, they get those cold instruments out, and one of them is a stethoscope, and he puts you know one in in his ears. I haven't been a doctor yet, but as you're chatting away about everything that's a struggle, everything you're feeling, all the like, uh, my back aches. You know, why not? Uh, and I've never met a doctor yet that puts the end of the stethoscope to your mouth. Right? You can chat away, and he's sort of listening enough, but what's he listening to? Boom, boom. He tunes in the heartbeat. This is what I want us to reflect on in closing today, on the one skill that will help us get love right. Now, how we translate that in kind of interpersonal terms is when we... When, we're, when we do listening and put the stethoscope to the mouth, we're a listener that takes things too literally. So when our spouse says, oh my gosh, I, you know, I'm so tired, I've, been, I've just done everything today. I would put the stethoscope to the mouth. Oh my God, I can't believe you said everything. You always forget, I cleaned the garage yesterday and already, like, whoa, how did that derail? Because I took what they were saying Literally. When we take things literally, we will find plenty to disagree with. We'll find the discrepancy in the literal description. When that same thing is said, I'm using this that go to the heartbeat, and they say they've done everything, and we're listening to the heartbeat. What's listening to the heartbeat? Okay. Wow, it sounds like you're overwhelmed. Sounds like you, you've been doing too much around here. Or in simple terms, we could say, listen to heartbeat, we're listening for emotional content. This will change your world. When your interpersonal skill of listening uses a stethoscope that tunes into the heart and listens to whatever comes your way and you're listening for the heartbeat of what's being said. So when your kid says, I hate school, and we take that literally, Oh my gosh, you hate school? This is terrible. You're going to have a job someday. And you're going to end up hating your job. You're going to be homeless. You can't hate school. But heartbeat is, 
wow, it sounds like school feels like a drag to you. It does. What's the worst part? Oh, Sally is not playing with me. Oh, it sounds like that's recess is hard right now. You know, and then we actually get to the heart of what they're going through because we're actually listening from our heart to their heart. Right? So I want you to take note of that. Listen for emotional content. And when we do it, it actually helps us on that other part on being quick to listen, slow to speak. What's the emotional intelligence part of this? We listen for a purpose. We listen so we can understand it. We can understand their journey. We're so hyped on agree, disagree. Well, I'll listen up until I hear something kind of, uh -uh, and then I'll jump in and tell you how you're wrong. Emotional intelligence is, I'm going to understand what you're saying. I'm not here to agree or disagree. Who am I? There is a God, and it's not me. So, in closing, you might want to reflect on how God loves. And what we say at the end, we want this face-to-face, heart-to-heart. That's our little tagline. And he says at the end of that parable, the Good Samaritan, go and do likewise. But well, what did that Samaritan do? He went there in, 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 in all ways. You know, that, that intimate connection is because the per person feels seen and not judged. That is getting love right. We see the person, even though we see the Empathy helps us not get tripped out by the defects. Why? Because the, emo the emotional stethoscope goes in and says, wow, I sense something's up. Tell me what's going on for you. Rather than, there you go again. All right. So, again, in the spirit of self-reflection, take whatever notes you can as it relates to, so you have your little outline there, or, you know, what you have there, and you have your notepad, make sure you're taking notes somewhere in that notepad on what you're doing with your life, or what you're doing with empathy, or what you're doing with seeing people, or what you're doing with the people you love that are all encrusted with all their defects, and what you're going to do about it. Make notes on who you blame the most. Make notes on everybody in your family and everybody in your circle, and what kind of empathy you do or don't have lately. So all the same, take inventory, keep taking inventory. What we're going to do next week, so there's unique, and Father Pete's going to help me out next week. I will be, I mean, I'll be on the screen. I'll have some video of me. Um, but I'll be, pray for me, I'll be in Houston uh, speaking at the Archdiocese Marriage Conference, hmm. which is totally exciting. And the keynote is Deacon Stephen Hughes. I don't know if you know him, but I have like a psychology crush on him. And so, um, <laughs> he's a psychologist. And and um, so anyway, I'm blessed to be asked to do that. So I bodily won't be here. I'll be here virtually as well as Father Pete and I talking about. But one of the, one of the areas of focus I'll be just, uh, discussing next week for sure is if we're taking just what we've learned so far and we're saying, how's that going to show up at St. Basil? Because we get love right, that's going to be 100 new people in this church by the end of 2020. Or that kind of thing. And again, not for numbers' sake, but because there's people that you love that you're going to love even more in a way of reaching out to them in a certain way. Whatever this ministry is about, I want you guys talking about that. If we got love right in our ministry in the church, that's what we're going to discuss next week. And I want you guys to almost be ready to say, I want to be part of something like that. What part do I play? Okay, so because you're the community and you have... Uh, opportunity to create beautiful things here. Okay, with that, I will stop talking. Thank you for the extra time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Guys. Thank you, George, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Have a wonderful evening, and hopefully, we'll see you very soon.